Welcome to A Million Baptist Podcast, where we discuss church life, theological questions, and cultural influences. Our podcasts are available via Google, Spotify, Apple, and many other podcast platforms. We hope you subscribe and enjoy today's episode. Hey everyone, welcome to Amelia Baptist Roundtables. I'm so glad that you're here. I um, hope you've enjoyed uh, the last several roundtables we've uh, put out. Uh, many of you have left comments and gotten in touch with us, and we're very encouraging, and so thank you. It means a lot when we hear back from you, so please continue doing that. Remember, you can find these Amelia Baptist Roundtables on our YouTube channel, Amelia uh, Baptist Church, as well as our Facebook page. That's where you'll find the video. And then we podcast um, on all the platforms, Spotify, Apple, Google. Be sure to check that out. Subscribe, share. We would greatly appreciate it. So I hope you're having a wonderful June 9th. We have a very special uh, guest here today, Pastor Neil and Pastor Ted Schroeder. Pastor Ted Schroeder used to pastor the Amelia Island Chapel. He's written several books, and you are going to learn a lot today of what it means to faithfully pastor and minister to the people of God. And so if you are someone who is considering the ministry, or you're in the ministry now, and it's just wearing you out, or you're wondering, man, what am I going to do next Sunday? I hope that this is encouraging for you. And if you're just a Christ follower seeking to know more about the scriptures, uh, today is a day for you. So join me in welcoming Pastor Neil and Pastor Ted. Adam, I want to thank you for that uh, introduction, and it's really been a privilege to um, to have known uh, Ted Schroeder, who's been at the uh, chapel. Uh, I believe you came there in the year 2000. Is that right, Ted? Correct. Yes. And uh, you officially retired in 2019. Yes. And uh, I tell you, it's really, uh, I've loved uh, our conversations. I've told quite a few people that you and I are opposites in a lot of ways, so we made good friends. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, listen, uh, tell um, those who are watching a little bit about yourself and uh, what brought you to Amelia Chapel. Well, do you want me to start at the beginning? Which is uh, when I was born. Well, uh, no, <laughs> although I did read about where you were born and, uh, and you know, yeah, just start when you, when did you get here uh, in 2000? What, uh, what brought you here and what kind of vision did you have for the chapel? Uh, well, I was uh, in San Antonio, Texas at a very large Episcopal church and uh, I'd been there 14 years. And I had done a great deal, and I felt that I needed to move on. I was in my late 50s, and I thought I needed a new challenge, but also I was tired of administration. Uh, I had a very large congregation with 30 full-time staff members to supervise, and I felt I needed to downsize so that I could concentrate on preaching and teaching and writing. And I had... Um, had a ministry in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, from 1976 to uh, 1986 for 10 years. And so we wanted to come back to this area because my wife's family were from Florida. She wanted to come back. So this opened up. I saw the um, position advertised in the magazine Christianity Today. And I was uh, most intrigued. I knew Amelia Island. In fact, uh, my younger daughter is named Amelia, and she was born in Jacksonville. And so we put our, I put my name in, prayed about it, and lo and behold, they called me to come here. I needed a change of uh, perspective and of ministry. I was sort of burned out in the large citywide church that I had. Well, I know you probably were gifted in those administrative areas, but your heart was in being a pastor and being close to your people. Yes, I wanted more time for people that I would uh, have a chance to sort of get to know people and to lead them and uh, teach them and and, uh, take care of them as much as I can and also to preach the gospel. Right. And I love that about you. I do. Which brings me to my second question is your initial thoughts about the state of the evangelical church, at least in this country. Um, There seems to be some shifting going on. 
there's some uh, threats and there's some strengths in that. And what are some of your thoughts about what you see going on culturally? Well, of course, when I came in 2000, I was leaving uh, a denominational ministry for an interdenominational ministry, and I was uh, aware of the changes that were going on in the mainline denominations, becoming more and more liberal, less and less evangelical, and it was not a hospitable place for evangelical ministry. And so I was glad to have the opportunity of of, of being in somewhat an independent congregation uh, which welcomed everybody and owed no allegiance to a denomination. And those changes have accelerated over the past uh, 20 years uh, and the new churches are independent, um, non-denominational, interdenominational congregations um, which are not having to hew to a denominational line. And um, it is certainly a huge change that the old line denominations, uh, the historic churches who have become very, very liberal, and uh, they have uh, departed from the biblical witness. And so the new churches are these huge you know, multi-denominational churches, and those are the ones that are thriving. It means it's quite a challenge for um, an older congregation to maintain itself evangelically in this kind of climate that we have today. I think Rick Warren uh, is an example of how he went out, and of course, even though he is... Um, traditionally Southern Baptist, and most of these churches are Baptist churches, but nevertheless, they uh, try to be independent congregations. Well, now as a Baptist, I can tell you we don't have to try to be independent. <laughs> in our, even in our new members class, um, I share with people that uh, our, we don't even really call ourselves a denomination. We're a convention because a denomination seems to indicate that they're one corporate entity and then each local body is a part of that corporate entity, whereas mm-hmm. Southern Baptist are each church is its own autonomous uh, entity. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the great strengths of an autonomous church um, is it's also its great weakness, and that is that it's autonomous. And so it's really up to the leadership and it's up to the local body to stay as biblically oriented and uh, with a high view of Scripture, a high view of Christ and and salvation in order for us to be an effective evangelical church. Correct. Um, Recently, we had a roundtable that uh, dealt with church membership and affiliations And uh, it seems like there's quite a few people who struggle with even wanting to identify or committing themselves to a church. What what's your observation? I know you've talked about the evangelical independent churches versus the old line. Mm -hmm. But what about the new converts and the people who are coming uh, even in these new churches, um, uh, you know, about being committed to a local body and being in covenant with a local body? Well, if you go back to Acts chapter 2, at the um, time of Pentecost, we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, that uh, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So adding to the church and being a church, being a congregation of believers, being the body of Christ, the household of God, the temple of God, all the different metaphors which are used in the scriptures about uh, the, the nature of the fellowship of the believers, uh, that um, that's part of the raison d'etre of the church, is that we need one another, we need to be together, we need to have a ministry of word and, uh, and uh, sacraments and fellowship and teaching, and uh, you've got to have a body of some kind of believers in order to nurture one another and encourage one another, edify one another, educate one another, 
and be sent out to right. plant new congregations. Yes, centered on Christ. Yeah. And I know that's been part of your heart. Now, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to talk with you is um, I've always appreciated John R. W. Stott's writings. Of course, never having met him really had an influence just in what he wrote. And I understand that he had a tremendous influence in your life and ministry. And how did uh, how'd you come about to know uh, John R. W. Stott? Well, when I uh, went to England for my uh, theological graduate work, I had a letter of uh, introduction to him, and he invited me to come and and stay with him and to uh, learn all about his church. And when I graduated from seminary, he invited me to be his assistant. And so I was uh, there with him for four years from 1960. Seven to 1971. So he mentored me and ministered to me, and we became great friends and remained so until the end of his life. Well, he certainly was a diverse person, um, mm. yet he was so Christ-centered in the mm. way that he thought. Um, I know that uh, he was an evangelist to students around the world. He was a careful exegete when it came to Scripture. He defended evangelical orthodoxy. He was committed to the same church nearly all of his life, wasn't he? Yes. he. Uh, in fact, he uh, grew up in that church. And uh, after he came back from his theological education, became an assistant in it and then took over as the senior pastor of it. You know, we're, we're coming into an era where preaching seems to me, and I don't, really don't mean to be overly critical, but I am concerned that they're really less uh, relevant uh, to what the real spiritual needs are in the culture. We seem to be accommodating ourselves to the culture instead of addressing what the real needs are uh, in the culture. And John R. Uh, w. Stott was outspoken about the preaching event and about its centrality. Someone wrote that he was a preacher who let the text shape the sermon. Mm -hmm. How did that have an effect on you being with him for those four years and uh, your approach to preaching? Uh, preaching at uh, All Souls Church in London, uh, when I was there, it was always expository preaching. And anybody who followed uh, expository preaching in those days or really way back as you can remember Charles Spurgeon and, and others of his ilk, uh, you took the text and you expounded it. And John Stott did that very thoroughly. He took every thought, every phrase seriously and he gave its meaning and application to our lives. That meant that he had to take his time to do that. And so the preaching event, as it were, in the service was, uh, was very, very important. Um, it meant that uh, when he wrote his books on preaching, which was uh, two books, one called The Preacher's Portrait, the other called Between Two Worlds, he uh, looked at every aspect of preaching and saw how that was an important task of educating the congregation. Uh, I've heard it said that, um, that some people say, well, you can't be too serious in your preaching. You've got to entertain in order to keep the attention of the congregation. And certainly through illustrations and humor, you can do that. But... The point of preaching is to preach Christ crucified, to preach the gospel, to communicate what it means and take the scriptures seriously. And that's what uh, the preaching that I learned from him was all about. It's really been sad for me to see, as you mentioned earlier, some of the mainline denominations moving 
away from that. They will use the liturgy of reading the Old Testament and perhaps the gospel and a psalm or an epistle. But then the message itself is more about social reform. Um, I did read, though, that, uh, that as, con- as evangelical and maybe even to some degree conservative that John Stott was, he also was concerned about social issues as well. What did you notice when you were uh, with him? Well, he was in a transition at the time that I was there. He was in his late 40s, and uh, I, was, I left when he turned 50. And in his travels throughout the world, he encountered a great deal of uh, poverty in the third world and uh, a great deal of, of problems that people had with structures in society. And uh, he had to address those things, and so he wrote a book called Issues That Christians Face that he had uh, had to deal with. And, of course, social justice is part of the the scriptures. Um, A lot of the Old Testament prophets were very strong on that, as as well as Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. So uh, it is part of addressing the whole person and the whole person's need, but salvation should never be... Uh, identified with social, political liberation or uh, just pure social justice movement, which which was the problem with the liberation theology that came out of South America at that time. Yeah. Well, you know, as we talk about social issues, we also uh, want to mention that he was um, a big proponent of lay mobilization for evangelism, or that is the gospel. And uh, I have a quote here that uh, John Stott said, the task of evangelism is beyond the power of the clergy. So uh, you mentioned earlier that he trained his people to listen to an expository sermon Mm -hmm. and how to uh, listen to its application and carry it home. Um, What did you see as far as mobilizing and training the layman for evangelism? Well, the the role of the pastor teacher is to equip the saints for the work of ministry, as Ephesians tells us. And so we see every Christian as a minister, as a person who has a vocation to use their gifts to uh, be the salt of the world and the light of the world uh, in their jobs, in their work, in their life, in their families, and so on. And so he um, had a training school in the congregation where he asked people to enroll to learn the theology of the gospel and the practice of evangelism. And he uh, gathered people into small groups. It was really the beginning of the small group movement, fellowship groups, and they ministered to one another. He never uh, felt that the clergy should be the one who is the minister and everybody else is to be ministered unto. Everybody should be ministering to one another. So let me ask you this. Um, I have uh, read uh, several of your uh, devotional books and understand that you've written a new book. You mentioned it earlier, I guess, about the teachings of John Stott. Do you want to share a little bit about that book? Well, John uh, wrote um, about 60 books of one kind or another. Many of them were expositions of of scriptures or commentaries. There was a series he did called The Bible Speaks Today. And uh, uh, so what I've done is that I've just read them all and divided them up into subjects so that we look at what is, was his teaching on God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, what's his teaching on salvation, what's his teaching on uh, discipleship, what's his teaching on the church, uh, what's his teaching on the last things, um, what are his teaching on social ethics. I mean... It can go on and on and on, all the subjects that uh, the scriptures do deal with. And each one of those I've tried to sort of um, give some representative quotations of what he's written and a commentary that will cover comprehensively what is Christianity as a whole and not just uh, part of Christianity. Well, it sounds like you took a systematic approach to uh, John Stott's Uh, theology and his books and the way that he uh, thought about things. Now, just tell me 
what are just a, as we come to a close, what are some favorite books of yours? Um, think of uh, a new disciple or think of a young minister. Uh, you can put them in any type of category that you would like. Um, uh, mine had to do with P.T. Forsyth because my mentor was educated in England and therefore he introduced me to evangelical writers uh, that he studied. So uh, if you were to talk to some either new believers or some men going into the ministry, what would be some books that you would uh, uh, like to share? Well, you know, we've been talking about John Stott, and he wrote a very famous book called Basic Christianity, which has been translated into many languages and has sold millions of copies, and that certainly... There's another book, though, called Christian Basics. Uh, if you turn the, the title around, Christian Basics also has a tremendous amount in it. He also wrote a wonderful book called The Cross of Christ, and uh, that's one of his most famous books. But the other person uh, who influenced me a great deal was C.S. Lewis, and C.S. Lewis wrote Mere Christianity and uh, a number of other books. So everything that C.S. Lewis wrote, I think, is wonderful. He wrote a wonderful book called Miracles, uh, which is worth reading. Um, I, I, I myself was converted through the influence of Corrie ten Boom, and uh, her simple books are wonderful books to remind us of the, of the focus on Christ. Other books that I've read, uh, you've got several here. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones's books are wonderful. His books on the Sermon on the Mount and the book of Romans and Ephesians. I have uh, his book on, uh, not his book, but his, <laughs> his uh, books on Romans. Yeah. And um, his, his series on the Christian warfare uh, are wonderful. Otherwise, um, J.C. Ryle, all his books I've read, and Charles Spurgeon, of course. Well, I've read only some of those, so you've given me a challenge here. I'd like to come to a close and um, uh, just, uh, again... Uh, read something about uh, John Stott because I know we've talked about his uh, uh, his view of preaching and uh, he's written so much about uh, different theological issues. But uh, I did read this and uh, it's very similar to uh, something that you wrote uh, about him in one of your devotions. Uh, a TV reporter once asked Stott, You've had a brilliant academic career, first at Cambridge, rector of 29 years, chapel, a chaplain to the queen. What is your ambition now? And Stott replied, to be more like Jesus. And as we see Christ's glory, we want to serve him. As we see his beauty, we will want to imitate him. And then this was written, for the discipleship principle is clear, the poorer our vision of Christ, the poorer out discipleship will be. Whereas the richer our uh, vision of Christ, the richer our discipleship will be. And um, it's been a privilege to read men like John R. Stott. And I can't wait to uh, read uh, your work on uh, his uh, systematic, or at least your systematic organization of his, uh, of his theology. And Ted, it's been wonderful to have known you since the year 2000. It was a blessing for me that you came to this area, and I've appreciated you very much. Well, thank you, Neil, and I appreciate you and your ministry here, and Pam's, and uh, the wonderful witness of this congregation. Well, we want to thank you for visiting with us during this interview with uh, Ted Schroeder. We hope that you will join us again at a later Roundtable podcast. Thanks and have a good evening. Mm -hmm.